way back in 1998, my wife Angie and I, we started the church here in Edinburgh. And I remember for those early years, things didn't grow very fast. The church grew very slowly. In fact, I remember it took us four years to get to 30 people. Now I was working full time in an architect's office at the time, and my wife was a teacher, so life was very busy, but the church wasn't growing very fast. But what kept me going in those early years, and, and for some of you who are leading churches or church planting, you can understand what I'm talking about. Sometimes it feels like things aren't growing very fast. What keeps you going through that time is your vision, your faith, what has God placed in your heart? And actually faith, what God's placed in your heart is what keeps us going through the, the tough times and the good times in our leadership journey. Rick Warren, who wrote the famous book, Purpose Driven Church, in the book he talks about many of the strategies you can adopt and many of the principles of church growth. But having been quite prescriptive all the way through the book, he comes to the conclusion at the end and having said all that he said, he actually sums up and says, actually, really what all church leaders have in common is faith. Churches that grow are led by people, are leaders who have faith. And this is what he said. He said, as I have studied growing churches over the years, I have discovered that one great common denominator in every growing church regardless of denomination or location, is leadership that is not afraid to believe God. Growing churches are led by leaders who expect their congregations to grow. So where does our faith come from? It's good to have a vision, isn't it? But it's better to have a biblical vision because biblical vision gives us faith. What is our biblical vision for church growth? Let me take you to Isaiah 54. It says, Sing, O barren woman, you who have never born a child. Burst into song. Shout for joy, you who have never been in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than her who has a husband, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch your tent curtains wide. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. For you will spread out to the right and the left. Your descendants will dispossess nations and will settle in their desolate cities. An amazing set of verses. How, do we be, how can we be sure as leaders in churches that our churches will grow? How can we be sure that church growth is part of God's agenda? Well, here's Isaiah 54. Isaiah 54 talks about the expansion of of the church. In Galatians, Paul quotes Isaiah 54. In Galatians chapter 4, he quotes this verse that I've just read to you, and, he's, and he, he quotes it in reference to the church. So Isaiah 54, this barren woman who's singing, this, this encouragement to stretch out your tent curtains is in reference to the growth of the church. So my question is, how do you know that church growth is a given? Okay, let me ask you a different question. How do you know that salvation is a given. How can you be sure of your salvation? Well, Isaiah 54 follows Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 is that famous set of verses 700 years before Christ came describing the crucifixion of Jesus in great detail. Talking about how he was wounded and pierced and, and whipped so that we could be forgiven and healed and restored. Our assurance of salvation comes from Isaiah 53, that Jesus bore our sins. That's why I'm sure I'm saved. Jesus took my sin. That's why I'm sure I've got righteousness. My assurance of salvation comes from Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 and Isaiah 54, it's interesting, in the original language, there was no chapters and verses. In the original text of the Bible, it just was one continuous text. Isaiah 53 and Isaiah 54 was one continuous flow of thought. What came after the cross and the resurrection? Well, the answer is, if you turn the pages of the Bible after the cross and resurrection, came the birth of the church at Pentecost. So what came after Isaiah 53, the crucifixion of Jesus and the resurrection, was Isaiah 54, 
the church, the barren woman that can sing, the church that was previously unfruitful, now having to expand, the tent curtains that need to be lengthened and strengthened. And just as we can be sure of our salvation based on Isaiah 53, he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. I'm sure I'm saved because of what Jesus did for me. You can also have the same assurance of church growth based on Isaiah 53. The reason the barren woman can sing, the reason a barren people can become a fruitful people, the reason a people who previously were unfruitful can become fruitful is the cross of Jesus Christ. You see, the cross not only pays the price for your salvation, the cross also pays the price for the success of the church. The fruitfulness, the expansion, the growth of the church was purchased on the cross 2,000 years ago. And so you don't need to hope for church growth. You don't need to wish for it, just like you don't need to hope for your salvation. You believe it based on assurances from Scripture. So also I have assurances that the barren woman will sing and God can do it in any culture, that the church can expand in any culture, not because we're so good, but because Isaiah 53, that Jesus, the price he paid, purchased not only your salvation, but the long-term success of the church on earth. That's why it says in Isaiah 2 verse 2, that the mountain of the house of the Lord will become chief of the mountains and the nations will stream to it. It's not God being wishful thinking, it's not optimism, it's a promise. That's why it says in Daniel chapter 2 about the church, Daniel 2, that the stone that struck the statue, the kingdom of God, the church the Jesus that Jesus built, the stone that struck the statue will become a great mountain and fill the whole earth in the last days. That the church is guaranteed to succeed because God is its guarantor. So you can have faith, no matter how big your church is, whether you lead a small church or a big church or a medium-sized church, you can have faith in God that he is the one who will give it success. There's a story of a guy who was watching someone fishing. And as he was watching this guy fishing, the guy was catching big fish and small fish. But every time he caught a big fish, he threw the big fish back. And every time he caught a small fish, he kept it. And the guy was watching him thinking, that's kind of weird because usually you keep the big fish and throw the small fish back. And the guy asked him, why are you keeping the small fish and throwing the big fish back? And he said, my problem is my frying pan is only 10 inches big. <laughs> so he was only keeping the fish that could fit in the frying pan. And I think we do that in life. Sometimes we throw away the big thoughts because we haven't got the frame of reference for it. We can't handle the big thoughts. So we, and do you know, sometimes many of us are not embracing some of the big thoughts God wants to send our way because we think it's impossible. Some of you are leading a small church and God's given you a big thought and you, because of your situation, you think, no, that couldn't happen. Well, I want to challenge us in our thinking that God's a God who wants us to be able to conceive of bigger dreams. You see, it's nothing to do with the size of the dream that makes it possible. It's to do with the accuracy of the dream. If God has spoken, embrace what God says. Don't refuse to embrace bigger dreams just because they're bigger. God's a God who can do great things right where you are. So we've got to change the size of our frying pan. We've got to allow ourselves to dream bigger dreams. In the middle of the last couple of years for us here in Edinburgh, we've gone through so many challenges. In the middle of all that, a friend came to me and said, I have a church building, I've closed the church, and I wonder, would you want to take on that church? It was completely the wrong timing for us. We were in the middle of trying to rebuild our own church. And here's this guy saying, do you want to take on another church? And as, as I prayed, and as I thought about it, I had a rise of faith. You know, if I didn't have a bigger frying pan, I might have thrown that thought away. But instead I said, let's do it. And do you know what? It is one of our most thriving communities here in Edinburgh. I'm so glad we took on that church. It's resurrected a church. It's growing. It's making an impact in the Muscle, Musselburgh area of Edinburgh. And so I want to encourage you, don't have small thinking. Allow your plans to be big plans because God is a big God. Our assurance of church growth, just like our assurance of salvation, 
comes not from our own ability or our own skills, but comes from a cross that paid the price for our salvation and the success of the church. God bless.